Yes, yes, you are. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, good morning, all. Uh, welcome to this technical session. So, a brief biodata about the legend, uh, Dr. Sudhakar Rao. He is currently working as a senior technical fellow at Northrop Grumman Space Systems. So, uh, he has contributed in many areas. Uh, uh, initially, I'll start with his career, his uh, studies. So, Dr. Rao received his BTEC from REC Warangal, uh, MTech from IIT Kharagpur, and PhD from IIT Madras. So, his professional experience for the past uh, 39 years so starts from ECI in Hyderabad, then afterwards LRD Bangalore, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Trondheim, Norway and then worked as a research associate at University of Manitoba, Canada during the past 1982 to 1983. Over 39 years, he worked at SPAR Aerospace Limited Canada, Boeing Satellite Systems, and now at Northrop Grumman, and contributed to antenna and payloads for more than 85 satellites. His work on development of radiation templates for complex antenna pattern antenna patterns for interference analysis was adopted and recommended by the International Technical U Te Telecommunication Union. He authored over 220 technical papers and was awarded with 57 patents and five trade secrets. His fundamental work on the design of multiple beam antennas in 1999 has been used by the satellite industry worldwide. He authored and co-edited three textbook volumes on Handbook of reflector antennas and feed systems. Dr. Rao is an IEEE Life Fellow and a Fellow of IET. He received several awards, including IEEE Benjamin Franklin Award, Delaware Valley Engineer Award, Asian American Engineer of the Year. He also has many other distinguished awards. So to name a few, uh, he, is, he received Distinguished Alumni for Professional Award for his achievement by this alma mater, NIT Warangal, IIT Professor S.N. Mitra Memorial Award in 2016. Recently, he has received the 2020 IIT's Binaman Behari Sain Memorial Award. Dr. Rao served as the distinguished lecturer for the IEEE APS and as an ADCO member of IEEE APS. He was the founder and chair of the IEEE APS Industry Initiative Committee during 2011 and 2015. IEEE APS Fellow Evaluation Committee member during 2015 and 2017. Founder and editor of IEEE Propagation Magazines. IEEE Application, Antenna Application Corner. Associated editor of IEEE Transaction on Antennas and Propagation and Associated Editor of IEEE AWPM. He is an executive committee member of the NCAP series, the, conference, the antenna conference work that, uh, conducted in India. Dr. Rao delivered invited and keynote talks for more than 50 conferences worldwide. Recently, he served as an IEEE Fellow Committee member of 2020 and 2021 and is a member of IEEE Fellow Strategic Planning Committee. He instituted IETE Dr. Sudhakar Rao Award in 2020 to recognize and honor outstanding antenna engineers. So, I welcome, sir, to this technical session. Over to you, Rao, sir. Thank you, Subhashni. I think you all thank, you, sir. thank you, thank you, sir. So I'll try to share my screen. Yes, sir, please. Can you see, see my screen? So it's loading, sir, I think. You guys see? Uh, not yet, sir. Still loading. We are able to yes, see. Sir. Yes, sir. We are able to see, sir. Right, sir. Go ahead, sir. Please. Thank you, Chinmay, for inviting me. And uh, it's a great honor to 
be part of ISA and uh, uh, give a talk. I think I uh, have been uh, part of uh, almost all the ISA so far and uh, hopefully in future as well. Um, so it's a great uh, uh, platform for uh, young students and uh, professionals uh, as well as uh, senior professionals as well to learn and uh, 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 network with others. So my talk today is uh, I was uh, uh, coming back from Las Vegas wondering what I need to talk. So initially when Chinmay asked me, I said, okay, instead of uh, giving the same talk, I thought maybe I'll uh, talk about antenna design. Uh, simple is elegant. So, but uh, I think I realized that it's a hot topic. So I'll <laughs> try to do my best. So I spent about a couple of hours uh, before and uh, uh, sort of arranged my talk. Uh, so, what I want to say is uh, always keep the antenna design simple. I think people have tendency to complicate uh, too much and uh, it doesn't work most of the time. And uh, especially from a practical point of view, if you want to deliver a hardware, definitely I think you have to keep the design simple and you know you have to know the requirements. Uh, so here I would say that designs done by academicians and designs done by industry, what's the difference? So when you are an academician, I think your focus is on research and publications. So definitely, I think that's an important part as well. But uh, you cannot, whatever it is, uh, most, most of the designs uh, by academicians, you can't use as a product. I'll tell you why. Uh, design by industry professionals, I think the focus is different. So whatever you design, it has to lead to engineering product. Otherwise, uh, there's no use. Doesn't matter how good your design is. If you cannot convert into an engineering product, uh, it's a waste to the industry as well as your time as well. Uh, focus here is mainly on hardware. So cost, mass, meet, and also to meet the requirements. You have to meet all the requirements. I think uh, people in the industry will tell you. If you don't meet one requirement, it's it's uh, then you have to redo. So I think that's, uh, that's a hard job. And then at the end, you need to deliver the hardware within schedule. So you cannot say that, oh, this is a complicated job I cannot do in 12 months. No, the launch won't uh, stop because uh, you're late. So you have to do whatever you have to do to deliver the product in time. So what I talk, uh, my talk is basically how you design uh, these complicated systems. And uh, I can tell you that all these uh, designs you can probably do without doing any software analysis. If you know the design principles, you can design most of the complex systems within probably a few days, maybe in a few hours sometimes. Uh, but of course, it's not the final at the end when you when you design, then you have to prove by analysis. So then you use the software, but you cannot the design uh, you cannot design it through software simulations uh, all the time. So then you land uh, nowhere. You have to do many many simulations, many many months, uh, and then uh, the program cannot wait for that. So phased arrays are simple to design, antenna part. So you have to follow the basic principles though. I think there are some few principles you need to follow. And it's easy to analyze as well because it's a, it's a very simple geometry. So reflector antennas and feeds. Uh, this sometimes I think it's complicated, but many configurations uh, you have and you have to choose the right one. And if you are in the industry, I think you know, depending on the applications, what uh, configuration you have to choose. Uh, so it's not like you cannot, uh, some people even in the industry do a lot of uh, trades, uh, looking into five, six different configurations, but uh, that's uh, in my point of view, that's a bit waste of time. So some senior person should look into and narrow down to probably one design or maybe one configuration to look into more details. So, uh, most of these uh, reflectors also, you can design them by using Gaussian beam analysis, which uh, was published in 1999. And uh, you can, um, you can uh, uh, do your reflector designs as well as uh, even the complicated the contoured beam antennas, you can analyze using Gaussian beam analysis uh, uh, very easily. So these are some of the uh, antenna hardware I think uh, we have. Uh, one on the top left is a, a 64 meter radio, uh, ground station DSM uh, network in Australia. 
on the right side is a satellite actually looking on the on, on earth it's a direct broadcast satellite on the left is uh, um, the VAXS system, which is basically a phased array mounted on a modified uh, 707 Boeing. Uh, what you see is a phased array with the slotted wavegate phased array at expand. On the right side, you see a phased array for advanced UHF antenna. This is uh, 45 gigahertz. And on the bottom, you can see B2 bomber, but you cannot see any antenna. But all antennas are buried under the uh, under the structure because of the stealth uh, because of the stealth reasons. So they're almost like about 35 to 40 antennas on this. Uh, so when you install these, I think uh, uh, you have to make sure that they don't interfere with all these antennas are different frequencies. They have to be pretty closely spaced. So you have to make sure there is uh, no interference. So especially when you have a transmitter there, you have to make sure the receiver is protected uh, next to it. So there's all uh, different, different applications, different antennas. So there's no unique answer for that. So basically know your application, keep antenna design simple, manufacturable. So you can design, but I think manufacturable, of course, uh, you have to take into account the tolerances. Sometimes you have to design the antennas a bit more uh, than what you need, especially on the bandwidth, et cetera. You have to design over a wider band than needed. Uh, it has to be low mass, low cost. Cost is also a very uh, important factor. So you cannot sort of uh, 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 make a costly uh, hardware. You have to keep uh, keep aware of the cost uh, uh, cost as well and qualify qualifiable. So the design has to be qualifiable, especially for space and uh, air applications. Ground probably okay, but uh, they're harsh environments, so you have to make sure that. Uh, they withstand the temperatures, they withstand the wind shear, uh, wind forces, etc. Uh, so all these things are important. So mechanical operational environments uh, you need to take into account. So antenna engineering, I think you need to have knowledge in several areas. I think it's not enough to just have uh, antenna design simulate and use CSD or uh, FICO or some software, HFSS, that's not uh, that's not what we do. Antenna engineers know, have to know the systems, have to know RF, of course, uh, microwave, uh, not just antenna, microwave and digital as well. Manufacturing, that's very important. You have to know how to manufacture. Sometimes uh, if it is a 3D, if it is a low cost design, you have to probably use 3D manufacturing, which has come up quite a bit now. And we have done a lot of 3D manufacturing. Uh, uh, mechanical, I think you need to know the mechanical qualification as well, uh, testing. So it's not, imp uh, it's important if you're a good engineer, you have to go to the ranges, you have to follow the hardware, test it, qualify it, and then till it's sort of integrated with the system, you have to stay there with the hardware. So that's how you learn. So understand the basics of antenna engineering, that's very, very important, that's fundamental. We all know from uh, schools, I think we learn a lot and uh, you have to uh, polish your basics. So what is important for antenna engineers is you need to understand the hardware. So there are a lot of hardware, I think sometimes feeds, there are different types of feeds, different types of reflectors, there may be 20, 25 type, different types of reflectors, phase arrays. So all these things you have to understand. Uh, so unless you understand the hardware, you cannot uh, be a good antenna engineer. So apply to engineering requirements. So once you have all this knowledge, then you know what requirements you have to design to and then apply these engineering requirements. So antenna subsystem, often it's not just uh, antenna uh, reflector or uh, horn. It uh, it's, uh, has a lot of components. Actually, nowadays uh, uh, we use the integrated approach where you integrate uh, even the uh, microwave components, uh, uh, system components into the antenna because that's how you make it cheaper. So it has polarizers, uh, OMTs or the more transducers, filters, diplexers to separate the frequency bands, uh, filters to uh, sort of reject other unwanted frequencies, sometimes frequency selective surfaces, uh, though I think it's uh, 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 on satellite, I think it has been used, but uh, their way to get rid of FSS the radomes, I think sometimes you have to have radomes. 
uh, beam forming networks, waveguides, we need a rigid waveguide and flex waveguide as well to interface with the repeaters. So integrated design is where you combine all these components into and then analyze. So what happens is you design these components individually, put it together, and then it doesn't work. Either your return loss doesn't work, your cross board doesn't work, or uh, your insertion loss increases. So only way to do that is uh, integrated design approach. You put all these components together and integrate from waveguide to the end of the horn or end of the reflector together. So that's an integrated design. So then design fab and test. So you need to uh, uh, have the knowledge of uh, testing as well. Uh, testing involves it's a, especially for satellites. It's a very long schedule. Sometimes depending on the complexity of the satellite, take almost like uh, ten months or so. So there are different types of tests we do, uh, and then deliver the hardware product within cost and schedule and meeting all requirements. So these are some examples of uh, missile actually, uh, which we are working now on an advanced missile uh, 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 ground-based strategic data range systems. So this is one of the biggest projects at Northrop Grumman, almost $100 billion. So we need to upgrade all the current uh, missile technology. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about it later. Can't talk too much, but I'll talk briefly what what uh, what we are doing. And then this is a satellite, I think, a direct broadcast satellite uh, uh, looking over the ground. So experienced engineers should be able to complete the design, 70% of uh, internet design for any given requirements within uh, within few days. So if you don't do that, then it's uh, it's a problem because people cannot wait, especially in the proposal time. You need to really uh, give them the antenna gains and the design so that uh, system uh, uh, system people can go and uh, uh, make the link budgets and make sure that uh, links are closing. Uh, sometimes uh, we, you are given only one week, two weeks to complete the antenna design. Uh, sometimes proposals are due in a month or two. So that means you have to really uh, do the uh, designs uh, very quickly. It's uh, no time to waste uh, uh, doing a lot of simulations. I think you might use simulations to check uh, your final design at some point. How to keep the antenna design simple? It's a really difficult task. So I'm not uh, saying it's going to be easy, but I think uh, there is a way to do that. You have to know the requirements. You have to know the hardware uh, very, very well. Uh, you know the antenna basics. And you have to design through fundamentals. And sometimes you have to develop out of box concepts. You cannot sort of say that uh, uh, one design meets all requirements. So no, that's not going to happen. Depending on the requirements, you have to sometimes think uh, outside the box and uh, uh, you should uh, never be afraid to go outside the box. Sometimes you fail, but uh, hopefully you don't fail that often. I think, uh, Everybody fails at some point, but uh, you learn the lessons and then uh, you you sort of proceed from there. So heritage and qualification is important. So sometimes you have to use heritage components where uh, your uh, hardware is being used on another program. And if not, I think you have to qualify the product. So I'll give you a few examples of uh, how to design simple. Uh, so what, what you see is uh, on the on the middle top, uh, the contoured beam antenna covering continental United States. Um, so you can see uh, Florida, you can see East Coast, West Coast, et cetera, et cetera. So when you have to cover these uh, 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 satellite uh, uh, payloads uh, uh, over this uh, conus coverage, you have to use an antenna system so the antenna system typically till almost 1990s used to be an offset uh, for parabolic reflector fed with the number of uh, feet or horns. So with filters, uh, uh, then they have, uh, you have beam forming network. So basically you vary the amplitude and phase of uh, these uh, n number of horns if you have, you vary the both amplitude and phase, and then you synthesize the beam. So depending on the beam shape, you decide how many number of elements you need. So, and then you have a transmit BFM. Sometimes the power goes as high as two to three kilowatts. 
So that means your transmit BFN has to handle all the power. And just the uh, uh, BFN itself is the head link block, block there because it's a narrow band, typically 15% bandwidth. So you cannot combine both the transmit and receive functions on the same antenna. So that's why people use two different antennas, one for transmit, one for uh, receive. Uh, and the cost of the BFN is very, very large depending on the number of elements. And uh, because you need two antennas, I think uh, cost is going to be a lot as well. But then actually the shaped reflector technology started in UK by Professor Westcott. So he's the first one who started the concept. And then uh, Tikra actually picked up and they developed the software. So the idea here is basically use, uh, instead of uh, using a number of horns with a BFN, uh, use a single horn and then no BFN. Uh, so make the horn dual band, both for transmit and receive, uplink and downlink. And then you shape the reflector surface depending on the contour. So basically you, instead of parabolic shape, you just, uh, 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 change the shape of the parabola such that you create a, a phase distribution at the aperture of the reflector, a uh, non-uniform phase distribution. So whereas here the Ill illumination on the reflector remains the uh, same, so there's no change. So it's a phase-only synthesis. When you do this, the advantage is uh, you don't need uh, two antennas. You can cover actually with one antenna, both the transmit and receive uh, the feed uh, covers. And then uh, it's a co the cost is very uh, much more uh, uh, significantly lower than the previous one. So this one actually we started, first one we did was uh, when I was at um, SPAR actually we did for MSAT. A backhaul antenna is a uh, K-band uh, band antenna. So first time we use a one meter shaped reflector surface. Uh, of course, uh, we used the TICRA software and uh, then we sort of designed and uh, 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 fabricated and measured, and uh, that, that was the first uh, shaped beam uh, antenna, I think, ever uh, in 19. We started actually before that, 1991 or 92, and then we actually, MSAT was flown, it became a joint Canadian and US program, and it was flown uh, later in 1994, I believe. So, this is one example. And it's a low cost and low mass as well, so that's important. And another one is a, a cordon, uh, is a communication on the move. So this is for the ground, uh, for the soldiers. Uh, soldiers in the battlefield, actually, they go through a lot of communication, so different bands, different things. So uh, currently they have four phase arrays, I think, uh, designed. Uh, one for KU transmit, one for KU receive other for uh, K-band transmit, uh, sorry, K-band receive and K-band transmit to, to communicate with the satellite. So there are about uh, 30,000, uh, 3,000 elements and cost is almost like uh, more than $10 million. And uh, mass and uh, uh, power is uh, pretty high because best there is are power hungry. So the uh, uh, US defense came to us and uh, said, uh, hey, can you develop this technology? Whether, uh, see whether you can uh, reduce the cost. So then we went and uh, proposed this uh, quad band pedal reflector antenna, uh, call it QBPR. So it covers all the four frequency bands. Uh, cost is very important. So what we did is most of the parts were 3D manufactured uh, and the pedals are 3D manufactured. So these pedals are basically the not the metal, but it's actually made out of uh, 3D printed using, uh, uh, using dielectric. And then they're uh, coated on the on the top uh, to reflect the energy, and then the feed sub reflector and the uh, and the uh, uh, cone supporting the sub reflector they're all 3D printed, and then uh, it has to cover over plus minus uh, 70 degrees uh, scan. So we have a gimbal which is a Potts gimbal which is uh, made by Flair. It's only 2K it costs. It covers almost plus minus. Uh, uh, 85 degrees uh, in both elevation and azimuth. Uh, so, and then we have a tripod because the soldier has to carry this. So the tripod is uh, made out of graphite, lightweight, and this is also quartz item. So most of it is quartz items. And then you have to pack these in a suitcase when the soldier is not using it, has to carry. So you can pack them all these six pedals into some extra as well in case if it breaks. 
So eight of them you pack in a suitcase and then uh, you fold it and you carry in a suitcase. So that's basic uh, configuration. So, key, uh, so with this, actually, we saved cost by 50 times, uh, which was uh, uh, $10 million is about to now with uh, uh, each unit is about 200K. And mass and power savings are more than 10 times. Concept design, drawing, fab, test, and delivery completed in six months. So we delivered to the customer. I think it's going through field trials now. We have a patent on this. Uh, so this is, uh, it's a simple design, but at the same time, it uh, serves the purpose and the customer is happy. Sometimes you have to see what the customer needs and you have to design your antennas accordingly. So this is basically how the soldier is using, he's communicating to the headquarters, uh, he's uh, communicating to the aircrafts and also communicating to the satellite at a different frequency bands in our situation. And uh, the mass is very low, it's about 10 pounds so that uh, Solia can carry it easily because this is not the only antenna I think it has to carry, there are other antennas also. So mass has to be kept very, very small. So these are some of the components uh, uh, 3D manufactured. This is because the bandwidth uh, it has to cover from 14 gigahertz to 31 gigahertz, it's more than octave. So we use uh, uh, quad rigid uh, horn, wide band quad rigid uh, horn. So this is 3D manufactured. It has two ports, uh, BP and HP, connected to a polarizer. You see the sub reflector, G shape, and then you see the red light uh, radome, which basically supports the sub reflector from the feet. So this is all uh, 3D printed. So is the uh, uh, gimbal system is Cots gimbal system. You can see the measured versus uh, uh, computed patterns match is very good. So return loss, I think simulated was uh, so our spec is about 10 dB. So we are meeting that on all all uh, frequency bands. Some differences uh, come because it's a 3D manufacturing is very hard. It's basically aluminum, magnesium alloy, uh, silic aluminum, silicon, magnesium alloy. So the roughness is a bit uh, more. I think technology is not there, but I think we can tolerate that uh, to save the cost. So I think there's some because of the surface roughness, I think there's some differences. Uh, so that's okay. So this is the quad band pedal reflector in the range. You can see the feed actually uh, with the rexolite radar and the sub reflector in one piece. And then the pedal reflector. In this case, actually, we used aluminum because at that time we didn't make the pedals. So to initial test. So mounted on a gimbal and, uh, and a tripod mount. It's a near field range. You can see the probe and the scans and the creates near fields and transforms into a far field and then you can measure the patterns. So this is the patterns uh, simulated and measured comparison. Matches very well in the copole gain wise. Uh, cross pole, there's some differences, like I said, uh, uh, because of the tolerances uh, uh, in, the, in the feed part, I think there's some <clears throat> differences, but uh, the levels actually, worst case levels match very well. All frequency bands, uh, uh, they really match very well. And then the key is a quadruplex, uh, how you separate all the four frequency bands together. So you, you have KU transmit, KU receive very close. So diplexer is, made, uh, sorry, quadruplexer is made out of three di di diplexes. So you take out the KU band first and then another diplexer takes out the 20 gigahertz K band another diplexer actually uh, separates the KU transmit and KU receive ends. Uh, so the return loss is very good. The isolation, you can see how the, this is the 30 gigahertz on the bottom right, how it is rejecting the bands at uh, 20 gigahertz and uh, KU band, uh, 14, 15 gigahertz band. So you get very good isolation, good return loss. Uh, next one is uh, extremely ultra wideband uh, antenna. So this is for maritime uh, uh, communications uh, uh, for the soldier on the ground. Again, it's one gigahertz to 60 gigahertz. So the, uh, ideally, if you have to use one gigahertz to 60 gigahertz, typically you have uh, uh, Vivaldi's or uh, some other elements, notch elements. 
So you need thousands of elements actually to meet the gain. You need about 10,000 elements, uh, but uh, technology is not there. Uh, 60 to one bandwidth ratio, you, you cannot make, uh, make an array. Uh, most of the arrays work over 10 to one or uh, at the most 20 to one bandwidth ratio. So people are trying to make 30 to one, but the 60 to one you cannot make. So what we did is we call it a segmented antenna. So we divided this frequency spectrum into three, uh, one to 10 gigahertz, uh, sorry, one to eight gigahertz, eight to 20 gigahertz and 20 to 60 gigahertz. And you have a separate antenna for those uh, three bands. So for the high frequency, since we want more gain, we have a uh, AD actually displays ellipsoid uh, reflector. Uh, for the medium band, which goes from eight to 20 gigahertz, we have a high efficiency feed. Uh, and then uh, low frequency is a quartz item, which uh, they procure from Pasternak. So this is a rigid horn, one for uh, vertical polarization, other for horizontal. Um, you can see the gain, uh, directivity versus frequency, not a gain, but directivity, uh, since uh, don't have the losses. Uh, the three frequency bands and the highest one goes up to uh, 44, uh, 44 dBi. And these are uh, high band antenna, which is the reflector medium band antenna, uh, so, and, and then the low band antenna, which is a quartz side. So MBA, uh, actually the uh, gain, I think uh, it's it's pretty good. I think from a on getting 25 dB is very good, but then customer wanted more gain, especially at the high frequency 20 gigahertz range. So then we have to make a unique uh, change to that, which is called, uh, uh, we attached a lens, which is a regzolite lens. You can see the grooves there because they're uh, uh, they're mainly for matching. Both you have grooves on the inside and outside. It's a spherical lens, so it's a shaped to to uh, actually enhance the gain. So basically, what it does is it makes the non-uniform phase from the horn to be more uniform. So once you have a uniform phase, we know that uh, we can increase the directivity. So this is a regzolite lens. You can see how much the directivity increased at the high frequency band. It's almost like uh, 8 dB or so. So uh, customer was really surprised and uh, when we did the analysis, but then we made the horn, made the uh, horn and the lens and uh, measured it, I think uh, matched pretty well. So another thing uh, we have is, uh, it's also a very simple design. Uh, this is actually the Air Force uh, wanted. Uh, there is no satellite which goes into higher frequency bands, BMW. Uh, the reason they want to go high frequency bands is because the bandwidth is very limited now. At, uh, uh, AU, AU band is about uh, maybe half uh, uh, 0.1, 0 0.5 gigahertz. C band is same. Uh, so they want to go to higher frequency bands so that you can get the bandwidth. So you can get five gigahertz bandwidth by going into B and W bands. 71 to 76 gigahertz is a downlink transmit band and 81 to 86 gigahertz is a receive band. So advantage with that is you can use the bandwidth, uh, uh, 10 times more bandwidth to enhance the capacity. So you can get more than one terabits per second capacity using these satellites. So also the idea was actually you can keep the ground uh, Antenna very small instead of having 30 meter type dishes. You can have something like uh, one meter, two meter type uh, antennas on the ground. So, but uh, nobody knows uh, what is the atmospheric attenuation at these frequencies. So, the idea is to launch an experimental satellite uh, covering the corners uh, at that time, actually, and then measure the uh, co pole and the cross pole uh, discrimination at uh, five different locations covering from uh, Florida, which is a high rain area, and Rome in New York, which is uh, medium rain, high rain, but actually not as much as Florida, but then Colorado Springs, Kirkland Air Force Base, and then Tacoma, Washington, and Elgin, Florida. There's five ground stations uh, at the different atmospheric conditions. So they'll measure over five years, uh, all the uh, 
copal signal as well as the cross pole discrimination. So then they know how much is the attenuation. So this one actually, when experimental uh, thing came, a lot of, I think everybody bid, like uh, all the major uh, uh, space companies bid. They came up with, with very complex designs using the reflectors, the shaping, and cost is very high. So whereas we proposed only with two horns, so because conus is more like an ellip uh, ellipse, elliptical coverage, two to one ratio. So basically these two horns are uh, in the north-south direction. So you create a uh, narrow uh, uh, narrow angle there around north-south. And uh, east-west actually wide, uh, it acts like a single horn. So it's a wide, uh, wide area, wide uh, coverage angle. So you make an ellipse out of it. But uh, they don't know the orbit where they're going to launch. It varies from 80 degrees to 120 degrees. So what we have to do is if you blindly design that, then your uh, uh, composite coverage, which is a uh, coverage of all the orbital slots together, increases more than two times. So your gain will be pretty low. So what we did is actually each uh, uh, orbital slot, 80 degrees, 90 degrees, 100 degrees. So we have a roll and pitch bias of the spacecraft. Uh, so with that, actually, we could minimize the composite coverage quite uh, um, uh, quite well and increase the gain quite a bit. You can see the gain contours here, actually directivity contours. So we can cover actually mostly peak is about 30 dBi and most of the edge we can cover about 27, 27 and a half. So most of the area. So this was very good and actually we built and delivered the hardware. And now we are going into the next, uh, uh, it, it's uh, it's going to be launched uh, uh, next March. And I think uh, people start actually measuring uh, uh, the atmospheric attenuation, et cetera. So already they're uh, uh, planning the next satellite, which we also got the contract. So we're developing a full satellite for this uh, frequency band, of course, without knowing the, we're well designing to compensate for the atmospheric attenuation. So, and then the ground is a simple uh, uh, 24 inch, two foot uh, ADE type design, actually displaced ellipsoid. So basically it avoids the blockage where efficiency is pretty high. So these uh, uh, ground stations, they put on all five sites and then they measure the copal as well as uh, polarization is RHCP. So whereas on the ground you have both RHCP and LHCP. So now we'll come back to Satcoms, I think I spoke uh, this chart many, many times, so I'll keep it brief. Um, so basically you have uplink, you have downlink. Uplink is basically uh, ground uh, transmitting the signal. So it's a C-band, it uh, transmits at uh, uh, six gigahertz, satellite receives it, down converts to four gigahertz, and uh, downlinks on the ground. So one is called uplink, other is called downlink. Uh, then you have TT and C-link as well, because that's also very important. So TTNC link is the only link which works when the satellite is in the transfer orbit. So if that link fails, I think everything fails. So that's an important part of it. Um, so Earth coverage is plus minus 8.7 degrees from geostationary satellite. So if it is a global satellite, then you need three, sometimes four satellites you need, including redundancy. Uh, key consideration here is the thermal. The temperature goes uh, very extreme actually when the sun is looking over the satellite it goes to plus 170 degrees or so and when the satellite when the sun is on the back of the satellite it's cold for the satellite so it goes up to minus 160 degrees so a big temperature range of about 330 degrees so when you design these antenna components especially filters and uh, duplexes and small gaps you have to make sure that uh, you design over a wider band to, to take into account these thermal guard bands from ambient to cold ambient to hot. So when you do that, I think you will, uh, uh, you're will you okay. So, and then you have to qualify too, make sure that uh, because it's in vacuum, so everything is, uh, you cannot uh, you cannot use any dielectrics in vacuum. So because uh, uh, outgassing issues and uh, 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 corona breakdown. So, and ESD problems as well. So I think, uh, in satellites, my theory is keep it simple. You don't use any dielectrics in space. Use mainly uh, pristine metals like uh, silver or uh, copper or aluminum. Uh, other considerations is high power. Like I said, uh, power goes up to three kilowatts or so. You have to make sure that uh, 
small gaps can handle the power. PIM is uh, another consideration, passive intermodulation. So when you have many transmit channels and receive channels going through the same antenna to save the cost and mass. So what happens is these uh, high power transmit channels beat against each other, create intermods, and if they fell on the receive band, it would be bad. So you have to isolate the receivers very well. Uh, so PIM typical levels are about minus 135 dBm to protect the receivers. So you have to make sure that it uh, depends on the order of the PIM. If it is a seventh order or higher, like third order, fifth order, you have to measure. So that measurement is expensive. So when you design, you make sure that you design at least uh, PIM levels of about seventh order or below. So ESD is another concern, electrostatic discharge. So don't use any dielectrics. Cross pole, I think uh, most of the satellites will have a 33 dB cross pole isolation. So that means uh, when you design these antennas, you have to design with almost 40 dB cross pole isolation. So that you give uh, customer won't agree unless you measure it. Measurement, of course, we know some uncertainty there in the measurements. So you have to over design that. So that's not easy. And bandwidth is uh, also important and the return loss. When you design these components, you have to make sure you get at least a 22, 23 dB return loss. You never accept anything like uh, less than 22 dB return loss. This is not just one component. This is whole uh, antenna together. Other types of uh, different types of satellites. Uh, they have reflectors for high gain. These are frequently used almost 80% of, uh, of the time. Lens antennas are never used because of ESD problem I mentioned. Dielectric lenses, I think people try to use before. Um, uh, our discuss has some uh, failure issue. Waveguide lenses becomes narrow, otherwise they become very heavy. So it's not practical. Array antennas, phase arrays occasionally used. Like I said, uh, when you go through advanced EHF uh, and you have to adapt the beam, very fast, I think you have to have phase arrays, uh, but they're expensive though. Medium gain antennas, they're horns, uh, global coverage horns, etc. 15 dB, 8 to 25 dB. Low gain antennas, we have uh, mainly for TT and C applications, 0 dB, 8 to 12 dB. Biconical antennas, which you can see on the bottom left, which is a uh, receive icon on the top of the transmit icon. One is command, other is uh, 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 telemetry. Uh, so it provides a, a, a figure of eight type. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, not a cardioid pattern, but it provides a toroidal pattern so that in the transfer orbit, you can, uh, you can receive signals from the ground very easily. Uh, services, we have fixed satellite service, uh, broadcast satellite service, mobile satellite service, uh, inter-satellite links, uh, personal communication satellite, which is a big thing nowadays to get the capacity at K and K events. So you, you design all these components, say for example, on the top left, uh, sorry, top right, all the reflectors, but uh, you design them, but when you put them together, it doesn't work that well because they have to take into account the mutual coupling, the uh, scattering effects from the spacecraft. So all these I think you have to do before I think you qualify the design. You say, okay, uh, I have completed the design. So you have to do all these analysis. That typically takes uh, probably a month or two. So unless you do that, your design is not qualified. So advanced age of payload, I'll talk a bit brief because it has a combination of phased arrays and uh, reflectors. Um, so typically, uh, we spend a lot of time. Six plus one, seven. Very small. You spend a lot of time. Uh, uh, several months, uh, six to seven months uh, to perform the different trades and do RF simulations. But uh, nowadays you don't need those. Actually, you can do very quickly uh, both phase arrays and reflectors. So that's I call engineering versus scientific. You can see the advanced HF satellite on the bottom left, and uh, you can see the you can see the number of antennas here. You have three phase arrays, um, two for transmit. You can see. Big, bigger ones because one cannot handle the power, so we need uh, two of them for creating two beams. And then the receive phase array, which is the uh, uh, crux of the whole satellite, uh, is at 45 gigahertz and it has about uh, 400 horns uh, uh, phase array. And it uh, it uh, it's mainly to adapt the beams uh, 
uh, to null out the jammers. So then you have cross-link antennas, which is on uh, east and west side. They're about uh, six foot uh, reflectors. And then there are high gain antennas and uh, other uh, uh, other antennas as well. Total, there are about 20 antennas on this uh, payload. So I'll uh, show some brief uh, uh, video. Advanced DHF payload, part of a system delivering unprecedented levels of assured network interconnectivity to rapidly deployable maritime, air, and ground forces, flexibly, where and when needed, immune from denial of service attacks, available in all levels of conflict. The payload puts the advanced in advanced DHF. A highly advanced digital processor serves as a switchboard in the sky, providing an order of magnitude increase in capacity versus Milstar, while supporting thousands of direct and rapidly reconfigurable flexible network connections between users on a variety of operational platforms. The processor implements advanced security and anti-jam waveform features to maintain both confidentiality and undeniable availability of U.S., international partner, and coalition networks operating at multiple security levels and within separate security domains. As with Milstar, the advanced DHF payload supports user logon and communications at lower data rates, worldwide, anytime, without prior coordination, and in the most hostile environments imaginable. And like Milstar, the payload features highly sensitive receive equipment capable of accurately processing lower power spread spectrum signals in the EHF band, enabling low probability of detection, stealthy communications in support of special operations. The payloads fast hopping uplink and downlink phased array antennas can flexibly cover a much wider area of the globe simultaneously with high capacity service. While both Millstar 2 and advanced EHF provide six one-degree spot beams, which can be steered to anywhere in the satellite field of view via gimbal drive antennas, the advanced EHF phased arrays support an additional six one-degree shareable spot beams, instantaneously steerable to any location within the satellite field of view. Operational planners have the option of allocating the capacity associated with each shareable beam among up to four separate regions within the satellite field of view done on a hop-by-hop -hop basis in milliseconds, transparent to individual users. Even with each payload's ability to deliver high-capacity coverage to upwards of 30 separate regions, there still could be a need to provide higher-capacity service to isolated users outside of these regions. The advanced DA Okay, that video basically shows the operational use of the advanced age of satellite uh, uh, in the war situation. So it has been used on uh, many wars, including Iraq and uh, uh, other areas, Syria as well, recently. Uh, so now I come to the uh, basics again. Radi radiation from the apertures, I think that's important to understand because if you have a square apertures, we know it's a uh, sin x over x distribution, you know the patterns, you know the side lobes are around, around 13 dBi, uh, sorry, 13, 13 dB below the peak. Uh, whereas if you have a circular apertures, we know it's a 2 j one x over x pattern. So x is the Ka times sin theta. Uh, so it has about 17.6 dB side lobes. Uh, and these patterns are very easy to, to, uh, uh, to analyze. Uh, even through calculator, but in reality, you don't have uh, you don't have uh, uh, in reality actually the uh, feed patterns never behave uh, either of them. So actually, you can see one of the patterns from uh, corrugated horns or uh, or uh, high efficiency horns. So you don't have any side lobes because the reason is you are eliminating the reflector with the feed. So you don't want any, if you have high side lobes or any side lobes where spillover energy will go up, spillover losses go up. So you don't want to do that. So you want to actually have no side lobes and gradually have more like a Gaussian beam type and then eliminate the reflector about 12 dB or 15 dB level so that you get maximum efficiency. 
So you need to know that. I think the behavior here is somewhere, uh, but you can derive from the Gaussian beam analysis, but uh, basic knowledge, uh, I think you need to know. And how, again, how much beam it you get with a square aperture, circular aperture, and with a Gaussian beam, so that you can design it very easily through Gaussian beam analysis. And secondly, I'll go through phase variance very quickly. I, here I use only two lattices. Of course, so people are trying to use uh, other types of lattices, but uh, I prefer to use only regular lattice because uh, there is a reason. I think it's a hardware simplicity. So you can sort of do other types of uh, lattices like random, uh, random arrays, et cetera. Uh, but problem is in the back end because your uh, inter-element spacing changes uh, uh, element to element and uh, you have to adapt uh, uh, all the back end electronics accordingly so it's some uh, it, it's uh, it could be done but it's a bit uh, complex job and it's uh, it's expensive as well so i'll keep always my designs to be either a square array or a, a hexagonal array sometimes people call it mm -hmm. triangular array but it's not correct it's actually mm -hmm. each a each a unit cell is a hexagon so it's a hexagonal array both have applications. If you have uh, like a satellite covering only plus minus 8.7, then you use a hexagonal, hexagonal array because it saves you a number of elements by about 15% and you can save the cost. Whereas if you go with uh, a wide beam like uh, radar type antennas, which are uh, plus minus 60 degrees, it has to scan very wide. Then you go with square lattice because your element spacing becomes uh, smaller and your element pattern actually becomes broader. So that's the reason you can minimize the scan losses. Uh, so both are, I think, uh, in use. Uh, key thing here to notice is the DS, uh, this uh, uh, spacing. So always you design the spacing between the elements using uh, at high frequency, lambda at high frequency. So that's uh, one over sine theta SM plus sine theta G. Sine theta G is where you want uh, grading lobes to be. And uh, theta SM is the maximum scan angle. Of course, you, 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 people think that you don't want any grading lobes, but that makes it very complicated. So you want to have grading lobes because you want to minimize the complexity and increase the element spacing as much as possible. But the grading lobes have to fall outside the coverage region. So if it is something like a, a satellite, uh, coverage is plus minus 8.7. So you want to put uh, grading, lobes, uh, grading lobes at about 12 degrees or maybe 13 degrees in the range. So that they won't affect the affect the patterns. Actually, side lobes of the grading lobes they should not fall inside the coverage. Uh, hexagonal lattice is uh, useful because it increases the spacing by about fifteen percent, and you can save the number of elements by that much amount. Uh, so here, element spacing versus the scan angle. You see the advantage of the uh, hex lattice. Uh, it it increases the Inter-element spacing thereby reduces the number of elements for a given uh, directivity of the game. So key considerations, you have scan angle, how much uh, you want to scan the beam. Array lattice you have to choose, uh, either hex or uh, square. Uh, bandwidth is important, so you have to design certain bandwidth. So elements have to meet the bandwidth. Scan blindness, sometimes if you don't design the arrays properly, um, you, you get a scan blindness, especially with the printed arrays when you have multiple layers. So if your return loss is uh, bad, at some points, actually some scans, everything reflects back, it's called scan blindness. So you want to avoid that, the techniques to avoid that. Polarization is important, either uh, linear or circular or uh, uh, dual linear or dual circular. And side lobes are important. So if there is no side lobe requirement, you want to make, uh, make the amplitude very uniform. So that way you get maximum gain and uh, narrower bandwidth. So flexibility is important uh, because flexibility is what phase array gave. It's a low profile. In most cases, you don't have the reflector, but low efficiency because your power added efficiency is about 25% uh, at the best because you have to use SSPAs. Whereas with the reflector, you get power added efficiency of almost 60% uh, with the nowadays uh, GAN technology. And higher cost because you have uh, more, more number of elements more amplifiers, more uh, uh, electronics, so your cost goes up quite a bit. Typical phase array costs about $10 million per space, whereas reflector costs about uh, probably 1 million or maybe less sometimes. 
So array design, I think it's uh, what you want to do is uh, what the number of elements will dictate your design. So that's given 10 to the power 0.1 dA minus dE. dA is the array di uh, directivity you want to have, or dE is the element directivity. So that's the number of elements. Uh, array directivity, you get uh, what is the typically gain is the requirement typically, big gain over the coverage. Then you have insertion loss. Typically, these elements have certain loss. Maybe the polarizers have some loss. Uh, scan loss, because when you scan to maybe 8 degrees or 60 degrees, depending on the application, so you are, uh, uh, depending on the element pattern roll off, you lose certain uh, scan loss. TL is the taper loss. If you have, uh, uh, typically, I use about 90% taper loss. Uh, IM is the implementation margin. So these are complex phase arrays. So you want to carry some implementation margin, about half a dB to, depending on the complexity you need to carry, maybe one dB sometimes. So design equations are simple. So the directivity of the array is the 10 log N, N is the number of elements. And then uh, uh, this is basically efficiency and the efficiency of the element and the area of the unit cell. So at uh, all this, you have to do at low frequency because that's where the gain is going to be low. So then you get the uh, N value. And then scan loss, you can easily calculate based on uh, 3dB beam width, which you can estimate based on your uh, array size. Uh, and then uh, uh, if you have a taper, you can estimate the taper loss simply by using this equation. So, I mean, if you, Want to have further details uh, about uh, uh, how to design phase arrays? You can refer to the paper, which is published in AP Magazine recently, April 2020. Uh, Colin Astrid is uh, one of the interns which uh, from UCLA who worked with me uh, for a couple of years uh, in the summer. So these are some how beam scans. I think once uh, on uh, if you're on the board side, you can see where the grading loops are going. For, uh, it's more like advanced EHF type of phase array. Uh, once you scan the main beam to say nine degrees or so, you can see where the grating lobes are coming, 13.5 degrees. And the grating lobes are almost the same level as the main lobe, slightly lower. But you have to see at, uh, what is the level of the grating lobes at nine degrees, whether it falls, uh, uh, falls very low below 20 or 25 dB. So I think that's also important. And these are some parametric curves, I think, which are useful based on the element size over lambda versus directivity you want. So one is a one is a peak uh, directivity, other is a, a, a scanned a scan beam directivity, and the dotted lines are where the grating lobes are for uh, uh, non-scanned beam as well as a scanned beam at uh, 8.7 degrees. So I think you want to be you want to increase as much as possible so that you can reduce the number of elements. So your element directivity increases. So typically about 3.5 lambda is the correct uh, the global coverage uh, 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 element spacing. And this is actually advanced HF phase array. You can see the how the elements are distributed over a circular aperture. In this case, we have to keep very low side lobes. So that's the reason we choose circular aperture uh, because intrinsically it gives the low side lobes, but uh, you taper the distribution and get uh, further uh, side lobe reduction. And uh, of course, all LNAs you connect and, uh, to the radiating elements and the heat generated by the LNAs, you have to take out through heat pipes, dump them into the uh, radiator panels on both sides of the spacecraft. So here it's on one side. Uh, and then if you have a very wide bandwidth, uh, very wide scan arrays, you can use either wave or leaves or rigid element or conical notch, which uh, we use uh, typically. Uh, and when you scan to 60 degrees, you can see on the, on the middle right. So you're actually, sometimes your grading lobes go higher than your uh, main beam, depending on uh, how you design it. So you have to be careful uh, keep the grading loops down. This is the L-band uh, reconfigurable array for GPS next. I think uh, current GPS has a resolution of about 10 meters or so. 
and for future they want to be much less than they want to have resolution of about uh, close to 10 to 20 centimeters so that means what dictates the resolution on the ground is basically what is the group delay the channel so uh, your group delay has to be very low so to do that your face center has to be very stable so it doesn't it shouldn't move with the frequency so that's when your group delay is going to be low so here we developed a 37 element array with uh, i call it a stair element array um, so we have a patent on that one uh, stair is because the polarizer you know all the gps uh, satellites are rhcp right hand circular of course on the ground the units are about uh, linearly polarized uh, to be uh, stable in phase center uh, i think you see the three step uh, septum polarizer and then your uh, stair element which is basically made out of a uh, chicken wire mesh uh, to reduce the mass uh, it has to be pretty close to the edge of the polarizer i think uh, when you do that your phase center doesn't move you can see it uh, typically gps has three frequencies l1 l2 l5 with, uh, ranging from 1.12 gigahertz to 1.57 gigahertz uh, so you can see the phase center moment is very uh, very small uh, or i think uh, what matters is uh, what is the phase center variation within the band so within the band is very less and uh, everything is uh, digitally controlled so you have a digital bfn 37 elements you have triplexer so triplexer is a key element here and then you have once you have a triplexer it separates all l1 l2 l5 bands and then you have uh, uh, its own amplifiers 37 times 3 number of amplifiers and then you combine through digital bfn and then form the different types of beams with a spot beam or earth coverage beam or some uh, uh, what is called a space beam as well uh, as part of it but of course uh, all these beams they have to share the energy uh, from the from the amplifiers it's the same amplifier so you have to uh, share it uh, properly so that uh, you maximum you meet all the requirements so reflector types coming back to reflectors i think uh, uh, how much time i have uh, sir so different types of uh, reflector yeah sir you have uh, how sir, much I time i have sir it's already we are delayed sir actually you you can you can go ahead sir no problem Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, I don't want to take too much time, but I'll just want to say that uh, there are a lot of reflector types, single reflectors, offset, dual reflector, shaped, side pad offset, cassette grain, front pad offset, cassette grain, imaging reflectors, multiple aperture reflectors, either three or four uh, for high throughput satellites, reflector, uh, reflector arrays, uh, flat reflector with resonant elements, it has limitations. So very narrow bandwidth, uh, so we cannot use for any satellite communication. So you don't see any communication satellites using reflector rays. They may be good for uh, for uh, space missions and uh, maybe on the ground, but not on space. Uh, they also have a, a problem with ESD and other things. So uh, I think they're very rarely used. On focal reflector, they're not practical where you have two paraboloids fed with a small phase array so it doesn't scan that well so i people try to use that confocal reflectors but uh, my recommendation is uh, so far nothing is flown in space and uh, because it's limitation so i think just watch uh, when you when you propose this confocal reflectors to any space mission so you have to be careful um, and then i think all the reflectors when you design you make sure you check the efficiency of the antenna so if anything less than 80%, I think it's not optimum. You have to go back and optimize properly. So this is the uh, AD reflector, which we used. It's a 52-inch uh, main reflector. So you can see sub-reflector supported by feed cone and feed actually eliminates. So this is actually displays ellipsoid. Advantage with that is there's no struts going to the main reflector. So that minimizes the blockage. Uh, and uh, hardware is pretty simple so you don't uh, uh, and then actually you get high efficiency compared to the regular uh, Cassegrain or Gregorian because you're shaping the 
reflected to avoid the blockage. So, and this also very simple. I think you can refer to my handbook for the equations. So, how you derive the efficiency and how you derive the uh, scan factor. Basically, the scan factor is uh, important. So, it's basically degrees per inch. So, when you have multiple uh, beams, you have to displace the elements in, along the focal axis or uh, uh, image plane axis. So, it tells you how much uh, spacing you need to give to scan the element beams at certain angle. So, this is very important equation. I think, uh, And this is basically how you derive the efficiency. You can always look back to the. Uh, so unless you are in this uh, region close to 80 percent, I think sometimes you are in, uh, around 60 percent, 50 percent. So that's not a very good design. So that means you didn't optimize the elimination on the reflector. And then you can create a parametric curves like this: uh, directivity versus uh, beam width for a given uh, given size of the reflector. So again, gain is uh, not the directivity. People misuse many times. So gain is directivity minus antenna losses. So on reflectors, we typically have a pretty, maybe one to 1.5 dB loss. So you have to characterize them properly. So the reflectors have RMS. Speed has certain losses because of the components, et cetera. So you need to qualify them. So idea is basically you maximize the directivity by your design and minimize the antenna losses by your hardware design. So that way you can get maximum gain. So some, I think, video, quick video maybe on uh, SMAP uh, reflector flown by NASA. So we made the reflector, uh, not programmer. Uh, this is a six meter mesh reflector. So you can see the complexity. The reason I want to show you is antenna is not out of design. You have to work with mechanical engineers, spacecraft engineers, everybody else. So the one in the black uh, cylinder is basically the mesh reflector made out of very thin molybdenum wire mesh, which is one mil in diameter, this mesh. So now it starts uh, deploying like an umbrella. And you have to deploy it very slowly. It takes uh, probably uh, 20, 30 minutes around. Complete all the deployment. Once it's deployed, this is a low Earth orbit uh, satellite, so it spins around. So as it uh, satellite travels around the globe, especially near the North Pole, it creates a hundred thousand kilometer swath. So this is a soil moisture active uh, passive uh, uh, mission satellite. So reflector is eliminated by corrugated feed there. So this is at uh, L band. So you can see the swath there. So that's basically. So then the contoured beams uh, uh, we have seen uh, before. I think some contoured de uh, beam designs. And this is how the satellite uh, in the deployed view. We have all the reflectors deployed from east-west uh, uh, east uh, panels. And there is some on the native panel. You can see the solar arrays uh, that gives the power to the satellite. And when the stored uh, configuration, when you launch the satellite, everything has to be closed. It has to fit uh, uh, most, most of the time four meter envelope, uh, sometimes five meters, but uh, that's expensive launch. So we try to meet everything within four meters. And then this is one antenna creating actually shaped beam over Africa and uh, Turkey. Uh, There's a C-band you can see. Uh, so by, just by shaped reflector. Other reflectors are for multiple beams. The, this is a conus beam for a direct broadcast satellite. Uh, so this, uh, this beam is a uh, unweighted uh, weighted beam, highly weighted actually to compensate for the rain attenuation. So all that you can do with one single uh, reflector antenna uh, by shaping the reflector. So this includes basically Alaska and Hawaii as well. And uh, the weighting is pretty severe because uh, Florida, it rains a lot, almost 10 dB more than uh, uh, where we live in the desert, uh, Los Angeles and uh, New Mexico, et cetera. 
So that means we have to give more uh, more gain to towards uh, uh, Florida region. So because your amplifier power is same, you're using the common uh, uh, tweeter. So only thing you can do is by weighting the antenna shape, which you can do with the shape reflecting very easily. And some feed the uh, different types of feed, corrugated feed, uh, multi-mode horn, high efficiency horn, which you use quite a bit. Releases for GPS sometimes uh, the uh, uh, GPS three and GPS two have a helices design. This is uh, uh, TTNC bicon antenna design, and then PEC is the patch in a cup. So that's also very good uh, at the low frequencies, L band and S band. So multiple beam antennas, I think uh, you see the countered beam on the left side. We fill the same coverage with a number of uh, narrow spot beams. Then you can reuse the beams many times. So that's how we increase the effective spectrum. In this case, 60 beams and uh, four cell reuse. So that means alternate beams are reused uh, uh, on the same frequency cell. We divide that 500 megahertz into 425 megahertz channel and keep reusing them. So reuse factor goes up about uh, 15 times. So effectively from uh, 0.5 gigahertz, you get 7.5 gigahertz spectrum. And uh, because you get the narrow beams, you, your gain goes up. So each uh, uplink, downlink, you go by 15 dB more, so 30 dB gain improvement. So that's how you get high capacity. That uh, several area schemes. This is for MBS for local channel broadcast, which uh, I developed uh, uh, when I was at Boeing, Direct TV 4S. So this one is a bit difficult design because you are uh, uh, you have uh, this is called the designated market areas. Uh, there are 216 in the US. New York is uh, number one priority wise, population wise. LA is number two. So you need to cover all these DMAs using these multiple beams. So each each color signifies uh, uh, one frequency. Uh, so you have to. Uh, combine these DMS together and uh, a cover three beam. And uh, when you use all these red beams, you have to make sure there's no copal isolation or you will have some copal isolation, but it has to be low, maybe 18 dB or so, so that uh, you don't create a unnecessary interference. So this, this design actually, you cannot do by simulations because uh, you go months and months without knowing what's happening. So this has to be done by hand using Gaussian beam analysis with the approximate uh, formulas. So when you do that and in your design, I think it matches very well. So some, I think uh, this is for, uh, again, it's UABs. It's a pen cap antenna, which is very small. It's, uh, it's uh, size is very small. Uh, I think about 0.6 inches in diameter. So you put two of them, one on the bottom of the left wing and the other is on the top of the right wing. So each antenna covers two pi steridians, so you get all four pi steridians. So this actually we delivered to the US uh, military uh, about uh, three months back. So they're using the field trials now. I think this, this design is also done within uh, probably four to five months. So it, it needs to have a radome as well. So design is very simple. It's a patch with uh, uh, 45 degrees uh, uh, corner cut uh, patches to generate the CP. But the uh, uh, key thing is you have to minimize the F over D ratio, uh, front to back ratio, F over B ratio. So we modified the ground plane and we attach to the wings uh, properly to reduce the front to back ratio. So it matched very well simulations versus measurements. So bunker antenna, we call this. This is uh, at uh, K band. RHCP, but the key aspect is it has to cover four pi ceridians. Uh, and you can see this is inverted F antenna. Uh, and I have a, so it, it has two positions. One is a deployed position, one is a stout position. This is goes on the uh, uh, backpack of the solar, it's a man pack. So it has to be lightweight, and uh, when the solar is lying on the ground in a battle situation, then it has to communicate. 
and when the soldier is standing and moving and it has to go above the helmet of the soldier that's why the two positions are there and this is how it looks like it has a clip actual antenna is on the right side the blue thing what you see is an inverted f antenna with the radar and it, it has uh, uh, support structures and it has a clip actually remove the clip what you saw in the video and fold it and then this is a conduit where uh, uh, you basically gives the flexibility and this is actually four by is very difficult to so we have to make uh, choose the materials properly material properties everything uh, so that it meets uh, meets the requirement ground antennas i think uh, here we are doing uh, uh, currently they have ka and uh, l and s band using frequency selective surface but now they want to add the nine more frequencies <laughs> to make it more uh, so that for future so then i think what we did is actually we removed the frequency selective surface we removed the feed on the top there's no cable a lossy cable necessary and we use uh, reuse the main reflector but you cut the struts we don't need the struts and then you have a new feed basically so it is a nested coaxial feed uh, actually it has the uh, waveguide at the highest frequency and then two nested coaxials around that to create uh, so we have finished the design we are uh, we have a contract uh, to build uh, three of them one for 5.5 5, 5, 5 meters two for five meters so we have actually completed the fab and uh, they are currently being tested so advantage is it covers a lot of frequencies from l x k actually c band as well uh, k band and high k band as well so gain i think improvement we saw was about almost uh, 1.5 dB both at uh, conventional KA and uh, LNS bands. It uh, looks complicated, but actually it's not that complicated if you look closely. Basically, it's three different frequencies. Uh, last one I show is a vehicular antenna. So this one is very, this is a new one I talked about when you contract with our future uh, 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 ground-based uh, strategic deterrent systems. Uh, it has a stringent phase requirement. Typically, it has 23 degrees phase variation, I think, on a, uh, on a current one. So, so now they have uh, reduced it to less than 1.5 degree max. So this provides a big antenna challenge. So this is the whole 360 degrees. Um, as, the, as the vehicle spins, your phase cannot vary more than 1.5 degrees. Um, so conventional have two patches. So that means, but uh, you cannot use that two patches located at 180 degrees because phase difference is pretty large. So then we used what is called a uh, segmented antenna. Actually, we have uh, uh, each segment is a traveling wave structure, one feed, and there is five slots, and then there's six segments like this. So you combine them, and uh, that gave bring brought back to about 5.5 degrees. That's not enough. So now we are developing a new antenna which actually uh, can meet the spec it's not there yet but i think we'll start from next year we have a design that meets but design is not enough so when we go to the uh, uh, simulation hfss and fico they said that this uh, type of accuracy we never uh, we never saw so they have to modify their mesh and uh, make it a more uh, dense mesh to uh, get the requirements i think if you have 1.5 degree phase hardware wise if you meet uh, one degree then you distribute 0.25 degrees to software and 0.25 degrees to measurement so everything is a challenge we talked to new field experts and uh, all of them are saying that uh, uh, we cannot meet that spec but they have to do some uh, development in that regard and uh, to meet that uh, phase accuracy so it's a big challenge so that's it. I think that's the last chart. And my conclusion is uh, antenna is a very exciting field to work. Uh, there is no uh, dearth of challenges. Every day is a new challenge. So I think it keeps going. Uh, keep hardware simple and design to perform. When I say design to perform, once you design properly, then you make it and test it. It has to exactly meet. So there is no way back. So I think uh, you have to be, in most cases, you have to succeed in the first attempt itself. There's no trial and uh, uh, 
you cannot go too many, too many iterations. Develop concepts and out of box ideas. Those are important for the growth and uh, where every day new challenges are coming. So you have to adapt to those. Acquire critical skills. If you are especially students, I think uh, right now you are getting a lot of uh, analytical skills from your professors. So use that and when you uh, go, uh, grow from there to either industry or acclimation, then you develop other skills like uh, other systems, RF, microwave, measurements, analysis, hardware, etc. Work with passion, it makes a big difference. It's not like uh, it's uh, antenna is not a uh, eight to five job. It's always you have to think about it. Uh, uh, so you have to, when, it, when you work with passion, I think it uh, the results will come and makes a big difference. So innovation should be the daily routine of uh, any engineer. So every, every day you have to think of innovation. If you are in the industry, of course, if you are in the academician, you also need that, but uh, more focus is on uh, research and publications. So this is my last uh, <laughs> Uh, comment engineers and in, innovate and researchers publish, which is true. I think we take pride in patents and innovations and uh, academicians take pride in publications. So 21st century satellite needs innovative antenna solutions uh, that leading to advanced uh, payloads. Right now we have what we have seen is not uh, probably it's maybe even not even 25%, but uh, future I think there's a lot of scope for uh, are developing uh, new products, new applications. I think uh, are coming. I think a lot of uh, Leo satellites, a lot of uh, 3D manufacturing, and uh, emphasis on cost and uh, uh, capability. I think growing up. So I think uh, it's very challenging. I think if you are an antenna engineer, engineer I think uh, you are in the right field. I think uh, I believe antenna is most challenging field. Uh, I mean, if you are work in the microwave, that's that's good, but uh, it's not that challenging in my in my opinion. Same for system engineering too. So it's uh, it it's it's good, but uh, it's not as challenging as antenna because no antenna is uh, like everything is different. So that concludes my talk. And if you have few questions and time, I think I'll be willing to take. Thank you, sir. That was really good. Uh, thank you, sir. That was very informative, sir, and educative and illustrative, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, uh, there are a couple of questions, sir. Uh, one from Sivada. <laughs> sir, should I, sir? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, sir, what she has written is, uh, she was asking about uh, one doubt in dielectrics. So if using dielectrics is a challenging in vacuum, would miniaturization, miniaturization yeah, be a challenge in satellite back, back end? So she's asking about miniaturization, sir. Basically. Uh, miniaturization. Yeah, I think the challenge with the dielectrics is uh, mainly I said yes. ELC, electrostatic discharge, because uh, it's vacuum. So and especially oh, on time delay lines for beam forming. That's what is her question, sir. So basically, she oh, wants. The back end, I think that's not the problem. I think uh, back end, you can sort of. Uh, at time delay things, I think, uh, you can always uh, make it a true time delay if you want. You can uh, get all the path links equal and uh, you can compensate and you can make it uh, a true time delay if you want uh, wide bandwidth. If it is narrow bandwidth, I think you can get away from true time delay. So it depends on application, it depends on uh, how you design the things. I think it's, uh, like I said, the ESD is mainly concerned for only antenna problems. It's not, uh, Repeaters and microwave, we can use dielectrics because they're all in a box. So there's no ESD issue there. So depending on the event, you can increase the thickness of the box and you can get away from ESD and the EMI, EMC as well. But I'm talking about antenna. Uh, use of antennas in space is, uh, at least I don't recommend. I never recommend anybody and I never used and. I never recommend people try to try to use sometimes, but uh, but uh, it has problems. You need to do a lot of qualifications to to qualify the uh, uh, micro strip or strip line or any other uh, electric loaded uh, patches or uh, antennas. 
DRAs, etc. Good question, Sivada. Sivada, any more questions, Sivada? You can unmute. So, uh, participants, you can have any doubt and questions, means you can please go ahead. So, this is uh, which you showed. Am I here? This yeah. design uh -huh. which you showed is not uh, very clear as to how exactly they would be going because it looked mechanically very complicated. Which one? Uh, can the you repeat, uh, Madhavan? Yeah, the last design which you showed, you know, is it still not fabricated, etc. It's not clear what exactly is your uh, intention. See here, what happens is here the phasing has to be made in such a way that you get it to 0 to 2 pi to get a good azimuthal coverage at the same time, a, a reasonably good cardiac pattern on the other way plane. So, for the band required, uh, I, are you envisaging some special methods for uh, phase uh, uh, shifting or any other way? Or is it self-facing? Uh, yeah, I, I think I can't talk too much about the final design, but I can say that uh, even this design, what I showed here is uh, not good enough. It has a five yeah. degree variation uh, in the fee. Actually, this variation, you need to cover elevation angle of uh, almost about 160 degrees from uh, mm. 75 degrees to minus uh, uh, minus 75 degrees or so. Uh, only some small area along the nose cone and uh, uh, on the back of the vehicle, I think you can ignore. But yeah. uh, but uh, azimuth the phase variation for different elevation angle has to be less than 1.5 degrees. So we are not, with this design you cannot meet. Initially, I think the spec was pretty large. I think yeah, it was about 11 degrees. But now it is 1.5 degrees, so we abandoned this design and you oh. cannot go with the traveling wave approach. So we have actually, you need to have uh, excite each element uh, with a certain, uh, and then you have a beam forming network of all the elements. And that's not enough, but you have to make it very compact, including the antenna, including the uh, beam forming and the back end, it has to be within 0.3 inches because you don't want to take out too much of the uh, spacecraft uh, material here and uh, other challenge we have is uh, uh, we have three frequency bands l1 l2 and s band so l1 l2 are for gps and s band is for uh, uh, tracking so all these three has to be very close to each other so then we need to install our fences if you don't install our fences then uh, your uh, uh, coupling actually kills the phase variation so you won't get 1.5 degree phase variation right now by simulation. I think we're we're uh, design is pretty good. I think we're within uh, within point uh, less than 0.4 degrees or so. Uh, yeah. But then we have to give some material tolerances, etc. So I think we can make uh, the antenna within one degree. But then the problem is how you measure the measure it and prove that uh, you're less than 1.5 because measurement. Are you making a scale model. To have a check. No, no, no. Scale model won't work because uh, the diffraction effects at these frequencies are significant. So yeah. scale models, people try to do that, but it uh, it won't work. I mean, if it is high frequency, maybe from C band to K band. Yeah, higher frequency is always better. Uh, this is very low frequency, one point uh, uh, one two giga gigahertz. So you cannot scale that. Uh, so scattering, scattering, and diffraction effects are pretty significant, especially near the nose cone and the, on the back of the vehicle. It's a good so question. Poss so. Possibly you may have to do some in-situ measurements after it is uh, integrated onto the vehicle. No, we are directly doing that. I mean, we don't go in between because we always go with the real uh, uh, prototype. Oh, I see. So uh, at this frequency, I never suggest, especially when the specs are so stringent, you use the right vehicle and uh, you have to get a prototype of the vehicle the right materials because it's not all metal everywhere so there are, there are certain material changes so we need to take that into account and uh, unless you do on a real prototype uh, you, you'll be wasting your time so thank so you good so much question, uh, thank you thank you sir any more questions from the participants good morning sir this is Sandra kumar 
but they haven't made a, a big uh, antenna using graphene because graphene material you cannot uh, you cannot make it very big so uh, what i saw most in literature of course i never worked directly in terahertz but uh, i think i worked up to 200 gigahertz but uh, that may not be enough but uh, most of them are around 600 gigahertz and beyond that i think even terahertz they have polished reflectors which are very expensive it, it has to be gold gold coated it has to be very polished and we have to do a lot of manual uh, trimming to reduce the rms within uh, typical rms needed is probably less than 0.1 mil or so so to achieve that you have to have a very high polished reflectors people have done that i think on the feed it's not a problem you can make it uh, at even 600 megahertz even 1 terahertz you can make uh, make with the current technology you can make uh, feeds uh, very easily and typically you make uh, uh, either gold plated silver plated and most of the feeds are also you make uh, 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 electroform and then you make uh, which is copper and then you coat it with uh, silver and then gold plated that's mainly to reduce the losses your insertion loss at these frequencies are pretty high so you want to minimize them so graphene i don't think your insertion loss is uh, is very good at the same time it's uh, the technology is not there to make it uh, uh, graphene into big structures so it may come in future but right now uh, maybe either i'm not aware or uh, I, i haven't seen any literature in that area so if you are doing research probably you, you might have seen some so you can tell me Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sir. Thank you, sir. Surendra, sir. Uh, Sudhakar, sir. Okay. One more question, sir. Uh, this is from Ranjit. What is the difference between beam forming antenna and beam steering antenna? Um, Or we can say both are same. Uh, is there is slight, uh, slight difference. I think beam forming. <laughs> uh beam forming you can without beam steering because you have say, an array you, will, you form the beam and the, you don't steer the beam so it's a fixed uh, fixed beam form. so that's beam forming network it it gives you a certain uh, it's all passive right but if you want to steer the beam then you need to have uh, active components like phase shifters attenuators etc so then uh, you combine those uh, signals uh, through either digital or maybe analog then so or maybe down convert to another uh, frequency and then uh, make the bfn so that's the, that's a beam steering so you need active components to steer the beam it's phase array is same the array part is same but then in between uh, uh, after the amplifier or, uh, uh, you need to have active components So before amplifiers, depending on the transmitter receive, you need to have variable phase shifters, uh, five bit or something, and then uh, variable attenuators if you want to shape the amplitude of the beam. Uh, otherwise, just the phase shifters, and then you have to combine them either with uh, uh, analog or uh, maybe digital. So then you can uh, vary the phase shift. You create a uh, create a linear phase print across the array, and then that states the beam. So that is beam steering. Beam forming is different. Beam forming is passive. I hope you are. I am to be. Sanjit, uh, I guess uh, sir has answered your question. Sir, there is one more question. Uh, if one wants to design antenna to receive signal from any particular planet, what kind of consideration the designer should think of? Wow, this is loaded question. <laughs> Any planet, 
Oh. Yes, sir. <laughs> then, then you need an email. <laughs> so, first of all, uh, frequency is to be defined. Now, every frequency you want to see what, uh, what you say, the radiation pattern. Uh, I, I still didn't follow the question, ma'am. Can you repeat? And from Tiwari, and from Tiwari, is that uh, who's speaking? Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, sir, can you please repeat the question? My question is, uh, sir, my question is, once we are doing now AI is in every aspect of uh, technology, so can we use uh, this neural network or AI technologies for beam forming network? Oh, definitely you can use that but uh, i think it's not mature to the point where you can use on a practical system i think people are doing some research in neural networks ai and uh, other fields i think which are promising but uh, so far i haven't seen any practical use uh, of neural networks and ai being implemented uh, on a phased array or any any other end so maybe in future right? a lot of research is going on so we'll see where it leads to. Sometimes it leads to very good solution. Sometimes it goes nowhere. So we don't know <laughs> at this point. Sir. Sir, sir, I think uh, sir has answered your question. Sir, uh, there's one more question from my student, sir, to you. To what extent, uh, Deepak, to what extent does the microstrip antenna arrays fit into the space applications? It, it, Welcome, sir. Yeah, it can fit in. I think you can see from uh, Nasia presentation he has used some microstrips for uh, different applications. Um, but on uh, space, especially with the high power communication satellites, it's uh, very rarely used because of uh, the problems I mentioned, uh, the losses, CSD, and uh, uh, other issues. But uh, if you are doing uh, a remote sensing type satellite or some some other type where the bandwidth is narrow and uh, the environment is different, I think you can definitely use it. But uh, you have to see what application and uh, uh, and what are the limitations. Sometimes you can use it, sometimes you can't. So. Sir, correct me if I am wrong. In receive, you can use it. But in transmit, we cannot because of the, as you said, it is less power, we cannot radiate. Yeah, transmit is more critical but, uh, for uh, communication satellites. In receive, we don't use it. It's not because of the power, but also it's because of uh, ESD issues. ESD and uh, other issues, I think, coming. So typically, communication satellites need a lot of bandwidth. Sometimes 60% uh, bandwidth, sometimes more. So printed antennas cannot provide that. I mean, typically the microstrip bandwidth is maybe 5%, 10% at the best. So there are other reasons, losses and other things. So uh, yeah, what you said is right. it's more critical for transmit, uh, transmit antennas, but uh, receive also sometimes it's uh, difficult to use microstrip. Unless you have some production, uh, ESD production, etc. Mainly in cases where we have very less bandwidth, that is for narrow bandwidth, or suppose we have a metadata to be sent, we can easily use a microchip antenna, whereas because the yeah. is not much. So, and, and many of the other cases where, where they have used is in the phase there is in or low earth orbiting satellites, where you need to only send data with a certain, certain amount of uh, data rate, which is uh, typical of a particular mission. Otherwise, as you say, communication satellite, they always go for reflectors because of the large gain requirement plus this also. Because the feeder loss will take away a lot of power, this thing, your efficiency of the system completely in case you use a microstrip array in a communication satellite. Dakar, sir? Yeah, any other questions? Yes, sir. So many, sir. So many. <laughs> they are 
Sir, okay. how to increase the cross polarization antenna, sir, in X-ray? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I would request you to summarize a few questions or combine few questions and ask one uh, final question, one or two final questions, because it's very okay, late sir. night for Dr. Rao. Yes, sir. Uh, it's already one o'clock, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, otherwise uh, we can just uh, send it, send them, sir, back. Like, sir, sir can answer afterwards. Yeah. No, you can ask one or two okay. questions. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah. sir. okay, sir. Sure, sure. Sir, uh, how to increase the gain for uh, CP antennas at X band? Uh, gain of CP antennas at X band. So, gain uh, if you want to increase, increase the aperture, right? As increase the aperture, your gain goes up. Okay, sir. So it's uh, not the, it's not the, it's not the CP antenna to LP. Any antenna, if you want to increase the gain, you have to increase the aperture. There's no other way, right? Only thing is uh, other other thing you need to increase the efficiency as well. Like I said, uh, you need to have the element efficiency and antenna efficiency pretty high. Uh, sir, one more question. What kind of material uh, used mostly in designing satellite antennas? Mostly it's aluminum. Sometimes uh, you have to, uh, aluminum is mostly for, for the feed components, sometimes you, like horns and other things. Whereas reflectors mainly is the composite uh, graphite reflectors because they're, uh, uh, they're, uh, 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 they're uh, low mass, low density. Mass density is very low, and uh, there's a special technique to make them. Also, you have to make in multi-layer with uh, uh, each ply 120 degrees so that uh, they're uh, polarization independent. So they can generate uh, any polarization you want, LP, CP, anything. So it, 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 you have to be careful about the cross pole, especially for CP antennas. So graphite reflectors are uh, widely used. Aluminum, I think it's. Aluminum. Uh, so aluminum also it's difficult to qualify, especially with temperature. So graphite uh, advantage is it's uh, thermally stable. With the temperature, it doesn't vary. I think you get uh, same RMS. Whereas aluminum, it, uh, 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 with the thermal gradient, the RMS goes up quite a bit apart from the mass. So that's not preferred. So aluminum is uh, not, uh, preferred for reflectors. But for uh, feed components, you can do aluminum, uh, 60, 70, or uh, other, other type of materials which are approved in space. Uh, but uh, for the feed components, you can uh, use a copper coated or sometimes silver coated to minimize the losses. So it depends on the application. So the communication basically use graphite reflectors and uh, 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 aluminum or uh, uh, silver or uh, uh, other coatings, copper uh, for the feed assemblies, like horns, polarizers, diplexers, etc. Uh, sir, one more question, sir. Polarization of space antenna is it RHS or LHS cir or circular? No, it depends on uh, the different satellite services. So, fixed satellite service like T band, you have uh, linearly polarized. C band is circularly polarized. Uh, personal communication, it's, uh, it's a circular polarization. Uh, sometimes RHCP, uh, LHCP, both of them dual polarized. Uh, it depends on uh, satellite service. We use uh, mobile satellite, it's uh, circularly polarized. So, it's uh, GPS is circularly polarized. Uh, so, it depends on application. The reason I think people use uh, polarization is you don't need to worry in the stations uh, uh, properly. You can have misalignment, you don't lose the gain. Whereas if it is linearly polarized, you have to align the ground, uh, ground antenna exactly in the same direction as the satellite. That way you don't lose. Otherwise, if you're slightly off, you lose, uh, you lose the gain. So. That's the reason people prefer to use uh, circular polarization and satellite mostly. But they're linearly polarized satellites. 
Okay, sir, we are running out of time, so we can mail the remaining questions to you, sir. Sure. Yeah, you can always contact me if you have questions. You have my email. I think uh, Chinmay can give you that. And, uh, always. Uh, Yes, sir. Okay, thank, thank you so you much, sir, for a valuable session, sir. Uh, over to you, Tinmay, sir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Chodashini, for nicely chairing the session. And of course, thanks to Dr. Rao for a wonderful session. I have always learned a lot from him, uh, technically, as well as on leadership activities, uh, especially during recent association with uh, INCAP, Indian Conference on Entertainment Communication. We don't call him leader, we call him a leader of leaders. So he actually guides the leaders in that way. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you once again to Dr. Allah. Over to our volunteers for, for some announcement. Thank you, Dr. Sudhagra, sir, for your wonderful talk. Uh, thank you, Subhashni, ma'am. Now it's time for photo shoot. I request all participants to turn on their video for virtual photo shoot. Thanks, everyone. The uh, link for feedback form is posted in the chat box. So, any connectivity issue again? No. I guess yes, sir. It's a connected issue. Okay, so I don't know. Yeah, Angu, can you speak again? So can I ask uh, all the other participants, apart from speaker and session chair, to turn off their video? Because a photo shoot is done. Your voice is not audible. Angu, can you can you answer? Yes, sir. Yes, now it's audible. I think we are having some network issue on our side. Yeah. Now it is audible, sir. Yes. So, uh, on behalf of our organizing units, I to play NPTS and APS Kerala chapter. And I to play student branch IIST and GC Batani. Uh, we are really thankful to Dr. Rao. He has been, he is the only person who has been a common speaker in all versions of ISO, starting from 28 to till date 2021. So he has been present physically in 2018, 2019, and he has been in virtual mode in 2020 and 2021. So I, I would uh, request uh, Dr. Rao to be, uh, you know, appearing in our podium physically in next few versions also. At least 10 consecutive times we want to see you. Okay? So, I hope so. <laughs> on behalf of the organizing units, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, present a memento to Dr. Rao. We are actually a little bit uh, tired of virtual. So the memento is not virtual, memento is physical and actual, but I am handing over this to Dr. Rao uh, virtually. So thank you. Uh, read out the citation, I took the NTTS and APS uh, Kerala section and APMG TSBCs of YST and GC botany. 
highly appreciates and honors the presence of Dr. Shubhakar Rao, Senior Technical Fellow, Northrop Grumman Space Systems USA, as invited speaker for IQP Space Antenna Workshop held during 23rd, 24th December, 2021. So this uh, physical plague gives me more motivation to meet Dr. Rao sometime soon so that I can actually hand over uh, to him and uh, have a real photo with him in this one. Thank you very much to Dr. Probably Rao. Probably during, probably during maps. Yeah, probably during maps and that too in presence of uh, Dr. Suvasi in his institute. In his, in his, in his. Hopefully, yes, sir. Yes. Hopefully, I am also waiting, sir. Okay. Yes, I love you to present the Chinmay. I have yeah. to take her permission to present. Okay, okay, you have to take her permission. Yes, sir, yes, sir, definitely, sir. Sir, but you are booked for the next 10 years, sir, for I saw already. And, well, 10, 10 years is too long time, so maybe one year at a time is good. So, this is an indirect way to wish you a very healthy new year, also. Yes. Thank you very much, and wish you all a happy new year and Merry no Christmas. And Happy holidays. Yes, sir. Thank See you. you uh, Time is 2022. Uh, uh, after today, go and uh, write your papers and submit to us. <sighs> sir, please, sir, don't do that, sir. Sir, we extended the date. Participants, please, we extended the date uh, till January 19th. Yeah, so there will be a few more submissions from our lab also. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Sir, okay. So, yes, thank you, everybody. Yeah, so, thank you. Formally close this, and we'll be here again after another five minutes. But don't wait for the last moment uh, login uh, glitches. So, here at one fifty, our next speaker is Professor uh, Dr. Giovanni Toso for Thank, thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you, sir. So excuse me. So, at what time we we reconvene? Because I was expecting it to start in one hour. Yeah. So uh, we'll start at uh, uh, just after uh, 55, 50 minutes roughly. From now we start. Uh, okay. Doctor Toso, maybe. So in four, yeah, in, in about uh, forty-five minutes, I will be I will be available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Dr. Rao, my regards and best wishes as well. Thank you, Giovanni. I think it's uh, nice to hear your voice after uh, many, many months and years. Yes, I hope, I hope we will be able to meet uh, in person uh, as soon as possible. I hope so, yeah. I think it should be maybe sometime next year, I think, is, uh, is uh, possible. It's my pleasure to, to extend a joint invitation to uh, Dr. Toso and Dr. Rao in our chapter sometime in 2022. Let's let's try. Let's try. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. So see you in in 45 minutes. <laughs>